This is section eight of the Million Pound Banknote and Other Stories by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The German Chicago by Mark Twain. Read by John Greenman. I feel lost in Berlin. It has no resemblance to the city I had supposed it was. There was once a Berlin which I would have known from descriptions in books the Berlin of the last century, and the beginning of the present one, a dingy city in a marsh, with rough streets, muddy and lantern-lighted, dividing straight rows of ugly houses all alike, compacted into blocks as square and plain and uniform and monotonous and serious as so many dry-goods boxes. But that Berlin has disappeared it seems to have disappeared totally and left no sign the bulk of the berlin of to-day has about it no suggestion of a former period the site it stands on has traditions and a history but the city itself has no traditions and no history it is a new city the newest i have ever seen chicago would seem venerable beside it for there are many old-looking districts in Chicago, but not many in Berlin. The main mass of the city looks as if it had been built last week. The rest of it has a just perceptibly graver tone, and looks as if it might be six or even eight months old. The next feature that strikes one is the spaciousness, the roominess of the city. There is no other city in any country whose streets are so generally wide. Berlin is not merely a city of wide streets, it is THE city of wide streets. As a wide street city, it has never had its equal in any age of the world. Unter den Linden is three streets in one. The Potsdamer Strasse is bordered on both sides by sidewalks which are themselves wider than some of the historic thoroughfares of the old european capitals there seem to be no lanes or alleys there are no shortcuts here and there where several important streets empty into a common centre that centre's circumference is of a magnitude calculated to bring that word spaciousness into your mind again the park in the middle of the city is so huge that it calls up that expression once more the next feature that strikes one is the straightness of the streets the short ones haven't so much as a waver in them the long ones stretch out to prodigious distances and then tilt a little to the right or left then stretch out on another immense reach as straight as a ray of light a result of this arrangement is that at night Berlin is an inspiring sight to see. Gas and the electric light are employed with a wasteful liberality, and so, wherever one goes, he has always double ranks of brilliant lights stretching far down into the night on every hand, with here and there a wide and splendid constellation of them spread out over an intervening platz, and between the interminable double procession of street lamps one has the swarming and darting cab lamps, a lively and pretty addition to the fine spectacle, for they counterfeit the rush and confusion and sparkle of an invasion of fireflies. There is one other noticeable feature, the absolutely level surface of the site of Berlin. Berlin, to capitulate, is newer to the eye than is any other city and also blonder of complexion and tidier. No other city has such an air of roominess, freedom from crowding. No other city has so many straight streets. And with Chicago it contests the chromo for flatness of surface and for phenomenal swiftness of growth. Berlin is the European Chicago. The two cities have about the same population, say a million and a half, I cannot speak in exact terms, because I only know what Chicago's population was week before last, but at that time it was about a million and a half. 
fifteen years ago berlin and chicago were large cities of course but neither of them was the giant it now is but now the parallels fail only parts of chicago are stately and beautiful whereas all of berlin is stately and substantial and it is not merely in parts but uniformly beautiful there are buildings in chicago that are architecturally finer than any in berlin i think but what i have just said above is still true these two flat cities would lead the world for phenomenal good health if london were out of the way as it is london leads by a point or two berlin's death rate is only nineteen in the thousand fourteen years ago the rate was a third higher berlin is a surprise in a great many ways in a multitude of ways to speak strongly and be exact it seems to be the most governed city in the world but one must admit that it also seems to be the best governed method and system are observable on every hand in great things in little things in all details of whatsoever size and it is not method and system on paper and there an end it is method and system in practice it has a rule for everything and puts the rule in force puts it in force against the poor and powerful alike without favor or prejudice it deals with great matters and minute particulars with equal faithfulness and with a plodding and painstaking diligence and persistency which compel admiration and sometimes regret there are several taxes and they are collected quarterly collected is the word they are not merely levied they are collected every time this makes light taxes it is in cities and countries where a considerable part of the community shirk payment that taxes have to be lifted to a burdensome rate here the police keep coming calmly and patiently until you pay your tax they charge you five or ten cents per visit after the first call by experiment you will find that they will presently collect that money in one respect the million and a half of berlin's population are like a family the head of this large family knows the names of its several members and where the said members are located and when and where they were born and what they do for a living and what their religious brand is whoever comes to berlin must furnish these particulars to the police immediately moreover if he knows how long he is going to stay he must say so if he take a house he will be taxed on the rent and taxed also on his income he will not be asked what his income is and so he may save some lies for home consumption the police will estimate his income from the house rent he pays and tax him on that basis duties on imported articles are collected with inflexible fidelity be the sum large or little but the methods are gentle prompt and full of the spirit of accommodation the postman attends to the whole matter for you in cases where the article comes by mail and you have no trouble and suffer no inconvenience the other day a friend of mine was informed that there was a package in the post office for him containing a lady's silk belt with gold clasp and a gold chain to hang a bunch of keys on in his first agitation he was going to try to bribe the postman to chalk it through but acted upon his sober second thought and allowed the matter to take its proper and regular course in a little while the postman brought the package and made these several collections duty on the silk belt seven and a half cents duty on the gold chain ten cents charge for fetching the package five cents these devastating imposts are exacted for the protection of german home industries the calm quiet courteous cussed persistence of the police is the most admirable thing i have encountered on this side they undertook to persuade me to send and get a passport for a swiss maid whom we had brought with us and at the end of six weeks of patient tranquil angelic daily effort they succeeded 
I was not intending to give them trouble, but I was lazy, and I thought they would get tired. Meanwhile, they probably thought I would be the one. It turned out just so. One is not allowed to build unstable, unsafe, or unsightly houses in Berlin. The result is this comely and conspicuously stately city, with its security from conflagrations and breakdowns. It is built of architectural Gibraltars. The building commissioners inspect while the building is going up. It has been found that this is better than to wait till it falls down. These people are full of whims. One is not allowed to cram poor folk into cramped and dirty tenement houses. Each individual must have just so many cubic feet of room space, and sanitary inspections are systematic and frequent. Everything is orderly. The fire brigade march in rank, curiously uniformed, and so grave is their demeanor that they look like a Salvation Army under conviction of sin. People tell me that when a fire alarm is sounded, the firemen assemble calmly, answer to their names when the roll is called, then proceed to the fire. There they are ranked up military fashion and told off in detachments by the chief, who parcels out to the detachments the several parts of the work, which they are to undertake in putting out that fire. This is all done with low voice propriety, and strangers think these people are working a funeral. As a rule, the fire is confined to a single floor in these great masses of bricks and masonry, and consequently there is little or no interest attaching to a fire here for the rest of the occupants of the house. There are abundance of newspapers in Berlin, and there was also a newsboy, but he died. At intervals of half a mile on the thoroughfares there are booths, and it is at these that you buy your papers. There are plenty of theaters, but they do not advertise in a loud way. There are no big posters of any kind, and the display of vast type and of pictures of actors and performance, framed on a big scale and done in rainbow colors, is a thing unknown. If the big show bills existed, there would be no place to exhibit them, for there are no poster fences, and one would not be allowed to disfigure dead walls with them unsightly things are forbidden here. Berlin is a rest to the eye. And yet the saunterer can easily find out what is going on at the theaters. All over the city, at short distances apart, there are neat round pillars, eighteen feet high, and about as thick as a hogshead, and on these the little black-and-white theater bills and other notices are posted. One generally finds a group around each pillar reading these things. There are plenty of things in Berlin worth importing to America. It is these that I have particularly wished to make a note of. When Buffalo Bill was here, his biggest poster was probably not larger than the top of an ordinary trunk. There is a multiplicity of clean and comfortable horse cars, but whenever you think you know where a car is going to, you would better stop ashore, because that car is not going to that place at all. The car routes are marvelously intricate, and often the drivers get lost and are not heard of for years. The signs on the cars furnish no details as to the course of the journey. They name the end of it, and then experiment around to see how much territory they can cover before they get there. The conductor will collect your fare over again every few miles and give you a ticket which he hasn't apparently kept any record of, and you keep it till an inspector comes aboard by and by and tears a corner off it, which he does not keep. Then you throw the ticket away and get ready to buy another. Brains are of no value when you are trying to navigate Berlin in a horse car. When the ablest of Brooklyn's editors was here on a visit, he took a horse-car in the early morning and wore it out trying to go to a point in the center of the city. He was on board all day and spent many dollars in fares, and then did not arrive at the place he had started to go to. This is the most thorough way to see Berlin, but it is also the most expensive. But there are excellent features about the car system, nevertheless. 
the car will not stop for you to get on or off except at certain places a block or two apart where there is a sign to indicate that that is a halting station this system saves many bones there are twenty places inside the car when these seats are filled no more can enter four or five persons may stand on each platform the law decrees the number and when these standing places are all occupied the next applicant is refused as there is no crowding and as no rowdyism is allowed women stand on the platforms as well as men they often stand there when there are vacant seats inside for these places are comfortable there being little or no jolting a native tells me that when the first car was put on thirty or forty years ago the public had such a terror of it that they didn't feel safe inside of it or outside either they made the company keep a man at every crossing with a red flag in his hand nobody would travel in the car except convicts on the way to the gallows this made business in only one direction and the car had to go back light to save the company the city government transferred the convict cemetery to the other end of the line this made traffic in both directions and kept the company from going under this sounds like some of the information which traveling foreigners are furnished with in america to my mind it has a doubtful ring about it the first class cab is neat and trim and has leather cushion seats and a swift horse the second class cab is an ugly and lubbery vehicle and is always old it seems a strange thing that they have never built any new ones still if such a thing were done everybody that had time to flock would flock to see it and that would make a crowd and the police do not like crowds and disorder here if there were an earthquake in berlin the police would take charge of it and conduct it in that sort of orderly way that would make you think it was a prayer meeting that is what an earthquake generally ends in but this one would be different from those others it would be kind of soft and self-contained like a republican praying for a mugwump for a course a quarter of an hour or less one pays twenty-five cents in a first-class cab and fifteen cents in a second class the first class will take you along faster for the second class horse is old always old as old as his cab some authorities say and ill-fed and weak he has been a first class once but has been degraded to second class for long and faithful service still he must take you as far for fifteen cents as the other horse takes you for twenty-five if he can't do his fifteen minute distance in fifteen minutes he must still do the distance for the fifteen cents any stranger can check the distance off by means of the most curious map i have acquainted with it is issued by the city government and can be bought in any shop for a trifle in it every street is sectioned off like a string of long beads of different colors each long bead represents a minute's travel and when you have covered fifteen of the beads you have got your money's worth this map of berlin is a gay colored maze and looks like pictures of the circulation of the blood the streets are very clean they are kept so not by prayer and talk and the other new york methods but by daily and hourly work with scrapers and brooms and when an asphalted street has been tidily scraped after a rain or a light snowfall they scatter clean sand over it this saves some of the horses from falling down in fact this is a city government which seems to stop at no expense where the public convenience comfort and health are concerned except in one detail that is the naming of the streets and the numbering of the houses sometimes the name of a street will change in the middle of a block you will not find it out till you get to the next corner and discover the new name on the wall and of course you don't know just when the change happened the names are plainly marked on the corners on all the corners there are no exceptions but the numbering of the houses 
there has never been anything like it since original chaos. It is not possible that it was done by this wise city government. At first one thinks it was done by an idiot, but there is too much variety about it for that. An idiot could not think of so many different ways of making confusion and propagating blasphemy. The numbers run up one side the street and down the other. That is endurable, but the rest isn't. They often use one number for three or four houses, and sometimes they put the number on only one of the houses and let you guess at the others. Sometimes they put a number on a house, four, for instance, then put four A, four B, four C, on the succeeding houses, and one becomes old and decrepit before he finally arrives at five. A result of this systemless system is that when you are at number one in a street, you haven't any idea how far it may be to number 150. It may be only six or eight blocks. It may be a couple of miles. Frederick Street is long and is one of the great thoroughfares. The other day a man put up his money behind the assertion that there were more refreshment places in that street than numbers on the houses, and he won. There were 254 numbers and 257 refreshment places. Yet, as I have said, it is a long street. But the worst feature of all this complex business is that in Berlin the numbers do not travel in any one direction. No, they travel along until they get to fifty or sixty, perhaps. Then suddenly you find yourself up in the hundreds, a hundred and forty, maybe. The next will be a hundred and thirty-nine. Then you perceive by that sign that the numbers are now traveling toward you from the opposite direction. They will keep that sort of insanity up as long as you travel that street. Every now and then the numbers will turn and run the other way. As a rule, there is an arrow under the number to show by the direction of its flight which way the numbers are proceeding. There are a good many suicides in Berlin. I have seen six reported in a single day. There is always a deal of learned and laborious arguing and ciphering going on as to the cause of this state of things. If they will set to work and number their houses in a rational way, perhaps they will find out what was the matter. More than a month ago, Berlin began to prepare to celebrate Professor Virchow's 70th birthday. When the birthday arrived, the middle of October, it seemed to me that all the world of science arrived with it. Deputation after deputation came, bringing the homage and reverence of far cities and centers of learning, and during the whole of a long day the hero of it sat and received such witness of his greatness as has seldom been vouchsafed to any man in any walk of life in any time ancient or modern. These demonstrations were continued in one form or another day after day, and were presently merged in similar demonstrations to his twin in science and achievement, Professor Helmholtz, whose seventieth birthday is separated from Virchow's by only about three weeks. So nearly as this did these two extraordinary men come to being born together. Two such births have seldom signalized a single year in human history. But perhaps the final and closing demonstration was peculiarly grateful to them. This was a comers, given in their honor the other night by a thousand students. It was held in a huge hall, very long and very lofty, which had five galleries, far above everybody's head, which were crowded with ladies, four or five hundred, I judged. It was beautifully decorated with clustered flags and various ornamental devices, and was brilliantly lighted. On the spacious floor of this place were ranged in files innumerable tables, seating twenty-four persons each extending from one end of the great hall clear to the other, and with narrow aisles between the files. In the center, on one side, was a high and tastefully decorated platform twenty or thirty feet long, with a long table on it, behind which sat the half-dozen chiefs of the givers of the comers, 
in the rich medieval costumes of as many different college corps behind these youths a band of musicians was concealed on the floor directly in front of this platform were half a dozen tables which were distinguished from the outlying continent of tables by being covered instead of left naked of these the central table was reserved for the two heroes of the occasion and twenty particularly eminent professors of the berlin university and the other covered tables were for the occupancy of a hundred less distinguished professors i was glad to be honored with a place at the table of the two heroes of the occasion although i was not really learned enough to deserve it indeed there was a pleasant strangeness in being in such company to be thus associated with twenty-three men who forget more every day than i ever knew yet there was nothing embarrassing about it because loaded men and empty ones look about alike and i knew that to that multitude there i was a professor it required but little art to catch the ways and attitude of those men and imitate them and i had no difficulty in looking as much like a professor as anybody there we arrived early so early that only professors virchow and helmholtz and a dozen guests of the special tables were ahead of us and three or four hundred students but people were arriving in floods now and within fifteen minutes all but the special tables were occupied and the great house was crammed the aisles included it was said that there were four thousand men present it was a most animated scene there is no doubt about that it was a stupendous beehive at each end of each table stood a corps student in the uniform of his corps these quaint costumes are of brilliant colored silks and velvets with sometimes a high plumed hat sometimes a broad scotch cap with a great plume wound about it sometimes oftenest a little shallow silk cap on the tip of the crown like an inverted saucer sometimes the pantaloons are snow white sometimes of other colors the boots in all cases come up well above the knee and in all cases also white gauntlets are worn the sword is a rapier with a bowl-shaped guard for the hand painted in several colors each corps has a uniform of its own and all are of rich material brilliant in color and exceedingly picturesque for they are survivals of the vanished costumes of the middle ages and they reproduce for us the time when men were beautiful to look at the student who stood guard at our end of the table was of grave countenance and great frame and grace of form and he was doubtless an accurate reproduction clothes and all of some ancestor of his of two or three centuries ago a reproduction as far as the outside the animal man goes i mean as i say the place was now crowded the nearest aisle was packed with students standing up and they made a fence which shut off the rest of the house from view as far down this fence as you could see all these wholesome young faces were turned in one direction all these intent and worshipping eyes were centered upon one spot the place where virchow and helmholtz sat the boys seemed lost to everything unconscious of their own existence they devoured these two intellectual giants with their eyes they feasted upon them and the worship that was in their hearts shone in their faces it seemed to me that i would rather be flooded with a glory like that instinct with sincerity innocent of self-seeking than win a hundred battles and break a million hearts there was a big mug of beer in front of each of us and more to come when wanted there was also a quarto pamphlet containing the words of the songs to be sung after the names of the officers of the feast were these words in large type warrant des commerces herrscht allgemeine bürgerfriede i was not able to translate this to my satisfaction but a professor helped me out this was his explanation the students in uniform belong to different college corps not all students belong to corps none join the corps except those who enjoy fighting the corps students 
fight duels with swords every week, one corps challenging another corps to furnish a certain number of duelists for the occasion, and it is only on this battlefield that students of different corps exchange courtesies. In common life they do not drink with each other or speak. The above line now translates itself. There is truce during the commerce. War is laid aside, and fellowship takes its place. Now the performance began. The concealed band played a piece of martial music. Then there was a pause. The students on the platform rose to their feet. The middle one gave a toast to the emperor. Then all the house rose, mugs in hand. At the call, one, two, three, all glasses were drained, and then brought down with a slam on the tables in unison. The result was as good an imitation of thunder as I have ever heard. From now on, during an hour, there was singing in mighty chorus. During each interval between songs, a number of the special guests, the professors, arrived. There seemed to be some signal whereby the students on the platform were made aware that a professor had arrived at the remote door of entrance, for you would see them suddenly rise to their feet, strike an erect military attitude, then draw their swords. The swords of all their brethren standing guard at the innumerable tables would flash from the scabbards and be held aloft a handsome spectacle. Three clear bugle notes would ring out, then all these swords would come down with a crash, twice repeated on the tables, and be uplifted and held aloft again. Then in the distance you would see the gay uniforms and uplifted swords of a guard of honor clearing the way and conducting the guest down to his place. The songs were stirring. The immense outpour from young life and young lungs, the crash of swords and the thunder of the beer mugs, gradually worked a body up to what seemed the last possible summit of excitement. It surely seemed to me that I had reached that summit, that I had reached my limit, and that there was no higher lift desirable for me. When apparently the last eminent guest had long ago taken his place, again those three bugle-blasts rang out, and once more the swords leaped from their scabbards. Who might this late-comer be? nobody was interested to inquire. Still, indolent eyes were turned toward the distant entrance. We saw the silken gleam and the lifted swords of a guard of honor plowing through the remote crowds. Then we saw that end of the house rising to its feet, saw it rise abreast the advancing guard all along like a wave. This supreme honor had been offered to no one before. Then, there was an excited whisper at our table, Mumsen, and the whole house rose, rose and shouted and stamped and clapped and banged the beer mugs, just simply a storm. Then the little man, with his long hair and Emersonian face, edged his way past us and took his seat. I could have touched him with my hand. Mumsen, think of it. This was one of those immense surprises that can happen only a few times in one's life. I was not dreaming of him. He was, to me, only a giant myth, a world-shadowing specter, not a reality. The surprise of it all can be only comparable to a man suddenly coming upon Mont Blanc, with its awful form towering into the sky, when he didn't suspect he was in its neighborhood. I would have walked a great many miles to get a sight of him, and here he was, without trouble or tramp or cost of any kind. Here he was, clothed in a titanic, deceptive modesty which made him look like other men. Here he was, carrying the Roman world and all the Caesars in his hospitable skull, and doing it as easily as that other luminous vault, the skull of the universe, carries the Milky Way and the constellations. One of the professors said that once upon a time an American young lady was introduced to Momsen and found herself badly scared and speechless. She dreaded to see his mouth unclose, for she was expecting him to choose a subject several miles above her comprehension and didn't suppose he could get down to the world that other people lived in. But when his remark came, her terrors disappeared. 
well how do you do have you read howells's last book i think it's his best the active ceremonies of the evening closed with the speeches of welcome delivered by two students and the replies made by professors virchow and helmholtz virchow has long been a member of the city government of berlin he works as hard for the city as does any other berlin alderman and gets the same pay nothing i don't know that we in america could venture to ask our most illustrious citizen to serve in a board of aldermen and if we might venture it i am not positively sure that we could elect him but here the municipal system is such that the best men in the city consider it an honor to serve gratis as aldermen and the people have the good sense to prefer these men and to elect them year after year as a result berlin is a thoroughly well-governed city it is a free city its affairs are not meddled with by the state they are managed by its own citizens and after methods of their own devising end of the german chicago by mark twain read by john greenman